Okay, so today we'll talk about uh, memory processes, encoding, storage, retrieval. Um, we'll talk about uh, a theory of memory called the stage theory of memory or the modal memory model that makes a distinction between different uh, stages, um, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory. The theory has been around for a while. Um, it's not quite right anymore, but still useful to go through the, the logic of the theory. And nowadays we don't really talk about short-term memory as much anymore. We refer to working memory, but short-term memory and working memory, they're, they're, they're similar. They're similar concepts. Okay, so first, in terms of memory processes, um, information has to come to us to be even stored in memory in some form. We have to acquire the information, we have to encode the information in some form. We rarely, if ever, store the raw information. When we listen to somebody speak, we rarely sort of store the raw acoustic waveform in memory. We store various bits and pieces uh, of this waveform. We listen to intonation patterns. Um, we listen to the words. We listen to the meaning of words. And those are all pieces of information that we can acquire or encode. And then we have to store the information in memory. Um, and this is not sort of a one-shot event uh, where there's some part of your brain where something gets stored. This is an ongoing process. Uh, where your brain is constantly working on retaining uh, or keeping something in memory. And then there's retrieval. Uh, something is stored, but you need to get it back uh, sort of in conscious awareness. Um, and that's yet another process. And failures can occur at every stage. Uh, we can fail to encode. Um, we can fail to um, store information. And we can fail to retrieve something that was there, but we can't get it out. There's a rough analogy with computer memory, uh, or computers in general. Uh, there are various ways to encode the information to get stuff into a computer through a mouse or a keyboard or a touchpad. Um, there's various ways to store information in memory. Um, and there are ways to get it out. Um, but human memory works very differently from, from computers in general. Um, computers are very good to retain information for a very, very long time. Human memory is more uh, fallible. So we'll talk about it, this theory of, of uh, memory. And they will, um, there's a distinction between three different memory stages. And these stages, they differ in terms of capacity and duration. So some stages might have a huge capacity for information, might be able to maintain a very large amount, um, and others might maintain just a few items. Um, that's one dimension in which stages differ. The other dimension is duration. How long can information be, um, be kept there, or how long can it stay there? Some stages hold on information just a few hundred milliseconds, other stages more for a lifetime. And it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, some stages that have large capacity of short duration and vice versa. So here's this um, famous stage theory of memory. Uh, it's also called the, the modal uh, memory model. And this was developed in the 1960s and 1970s. It was actually developed by my uh, PhD advisor, Rich Schifrin as well as uh, Dick Atkinson. He, was the, uh, he's, he later was, became the chancellor of UC, uh, University of California. So there's some interesting history here. Um, and this is known as an information processing theory. So this means that um, you not only say verbally what you think is going on uh, when people remember, but you have a very precise theory. Uh, your theory actually states very exactly how information is represented, uh, where it's represented, and how information flows from one part to another. So there are boxes here 
the boxes are these different stages of memory. The arrows show you how information can flow and what processes are involved in this information transfer. And there's incoming information from, from the environment in these, these arrows. And there's outgoing information. This is something that a participant in an experiment would say or would remember. Uh, so this theory says that what people remember overtly comes from short-term memory. It's not directly coming from long-term memory. You first have to retrieve it from long-term memory and then um, respond through short-term memory. So this theory is very powerful because it, you can, um, it's so precise, you can implement it in a computer program, you could simulate it, make predictions, and many of these predictions, uh, they hold. Uh, you can do experiments, and the computer makes predictions for those experiments, and the data from those experiments are in line with the computer predictions, so that's nice. So we'll talk about a few um, of these stages. So let's start with sensory memory. So if, if you see some complex visual scene, let's say this grid of letters, and then let's say you make an eye movement, you don't look at this grid of letters anymore, you have this fleeting sense of, of seeing these letters for just a very brief moment in time. So that is an effect of sensory memory, right? So you can close your eyes or I can remove this image from the screen and you are able to retain very briefly um, some memories of these individual letters. So there's something that persists after you take the uh, stimulus away. And you might think that you only briefly remember just a few of these letters, but actually your memory is much better. Your sensory memory, memory is much better than your consciousness suggests. And there's a famous uh, set of experiments conducted by George Sperling. So he's a distinguished professor here at UC Irvine. And I would like to highlight some, um, some research uh, done here at UC Irvine. So we'll talk about his experiments. Because it suggested um, that our sensory memory is much more powerful uh, than our experience suggests. So he presented um, subjects, participants in an experiment with arrays of, of letters, three rows of four letters. And in this experiment, um, this, this array might be shown for a very short amount of time, like 50 milliseconds. And then you have to uh, report any letter that you remember from this, uh, from this display. Now, there are a number of conditions that he tested. In the first condition, called the full report condition, subject C is array flashed for 50 milliseconds, followed by blank, blank screen, and then you're instructed as a subject to recall any letter. Um, from anywhere uh, in, the, in the array. And this is called full report. So a subject might say T, K, J, and G. And that's, that's, all, that's all they got from this, this condition. And the results show that on average, some subjects are better than others, but participants report four out of 12 letters. So a third. Well, that doesn't seem like a lot. Um, that seems like a lot of information is just gone. Um, but George Sperling, he, um, he was convinced that people are better than that. That sensory memory holds onto more information than just, you know, 33%. So he tested subjects in another condition. This is where the, the cleverness comes in. This is called partial report. Uh, so he had an insight that as you, as you go on and you try to remember these letters from this array, by the time you're at the fourth letter, your sensory memory is gone. Um, so maybe the problem is, is in the way you set up the experiment. Um, uh, you just don't have enough time to read all these letters because all the, all the memory is gone. So he tried a partial report condition. And here you're cued to read out a specific row of the grid. And the cue comes on after the display goes off. You can never predict what you're supposed to read out. Um, 
So there could be a cue in terms of um, an arrow, like read out the letters from the top row or the middle row or the bottom row. Or it could be an auditory cue, a high tone for read out the, the top row or a low tone, read out the bottom row. In fact, maybe we should um, see if we can get this demo. Maybe we can get it just a few trials. Uh, I'll skip a bunch of stuff. It takes too long. All right. So this never quite works with uh, computer projectors. You have to do this in the lab with you know careful, uh, carefully controlled uh, stimulus displays. Um, Ooh, that was loud. So that was a low tone. You're supposed to be at the bottom row. Um, so I don't remember anything. I was, <laughs> wasn't paying attention. Uh, okay, next trial. Now you sort of know. RT. All right. Oh, in lowercase h, yeah. I'm really not paying attention. I'll do this one more time. I think if we combine all the answers, we get a perfect answer. Uh, okay, so you get the sense of, of how this experiment is done. I think um, in the real lab conditions, it's shown much more briefly. It's, it's, it, I think it's, it's much harder. So, so you get this cue, you read out the, the letters that you remember from that specific row, and very importantly, you can never predict in advance what row you have to read out from. Now, Sperling found that in this condition, subjects report 3.3 Right, some more, some fewer, but on average 3.3 .3 of the four cued letters. Now, why is this important? This doesn't seem like we've achieved very much here. But there's an interesting logic you can go through. Again, you don't know in advance which letters will be cued. But you can, from the performance in the partial report, you can get an estimate of how much you would be able to recall if you could do any row. Um, and so if you recall 3.3 .3 or 4 Q letters, then that corresponds to 10 out of 12 letters from the whole display. And that's much more than one third. So he argued that if you only have to recall just a few letters, and you don't have this interference, or you don't have this, this uh, delay issue to deal with, where things just are gone from memory before you can even attempt to read it out, um, then you almost are recalling everything from the display. So he argued that sensory memory has a very high capacity. Uh, and he framed it, um, he coined it iconic memory. Um, so iconic memory is that part of sensory memory that corresponds to visual memories. Now, other demonstrations have shown that there's a similar um, store for auditory information called echoic memory. This very sort of uh, fleeting um, memory store. Things decay very, very quickly. So in, in one experiment, he uh, varied the length of time between the, the display turning off and the cue coming on. Now it's pretty easy if the display goes off and you immediately are cued, because things are still in memory, in your sensory memory. It becomes much harder if there's a delay. Now what he found is that if you uh, delay subjects by a second or so, then most of the information is gone. Subjects have a very hard time in this experiment. So Sperling estimated that sensory memory 
can hold on information to up to about a second or so, but it's more like a few hundred milliseconds. So that's the duration of that memory store. So any, any questions about how, how this experiment works? The logic behind it? Okay. So this, you hold on for this array of letters, you, you have some memory somewhere, but the important thing is you have to uh, pay attention to these letters in order for information to be transferred to short-term memory. Obviously, you can't attend to everything, uh, so only a limited amount of information goes through to the next stage. So the next stage is short-term memory. Um, so only things attended to can enter short-term memory. And short-term memory is thought to be a very um, limited capacity system. You can hold on, only hold on to a few items at a time. And those items need to be rehearsed actively before it can be transferred to long-term memory. So short-term memory is a limited capacity store. And George Miller, he did research on estimating the capacity of short-term memory. And he came up with this famous number that you probably are, have heard before, seven plus or minus two. Your short-term memory has a capacity of seven items plus or minus two. Sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on how you do the experiment. Depends on individual differences. But few people have a memory span less than five or more than nine. And George Miller wrote this famous paper in 1956 where he has this weird sentence in his paper where he says he's haunted by this number, haunted by the number seven. Because he did tons of experiments and they always showed that there's this very limited capacity in holding on to information in, in, in short-term memory. So you can easily demonstrate this I'll show you some digit sequences, and you have to remember this. You have to remember the digits in the correct order, okay? So here we go, 6194. Can you remember that, or can you? All right, this is just warm up. Very good. 965283. All right, good. Four two six nine eight five one. Maybe I make it easier by actually saying it out loud. Okay, next one. Um. Man, you you guys are good. All right, now now let's try the uh, the near to impossible one. So this feels much harder, right? This, this is, exceeds your short-term uh, memory span. Um, this is very difficult, unless you apply special strategies, very difficult to rem remember. So uh, one view of short-term memory, that's sort of the old-fashioned view, is that you have some discrete slots. Um, and you can put things in these discrete slots, and you have about seven slots or so. So seven words fit in there, or seven digits. But a more modern view is that um, it's, it's more continuous, uh, the capacity of working memory. And uh, what you store is not discrete things, it's more continuous things. And when you store verbal material, it depends on how you phonetically encode things. Um, so, we all have this feeling that we use our inner voice, uh, that when we silently rehearse things. And it turns out that your memory span is influenced by how quick your inner voice is. It, your memory span is influenced by pronunciation time. So you can do a very simple experiment where you have, let's say, six items that you need to remember. Burma, Greece, Tibet, Iceland, Malta, Laos. These are fairly short country words. 
or you can have longer words, Switzerland, Nicaragua, etc. It's the same number of items, but clearly the second list is longer. It would take you longer to use your inner voice um, to rehearse this list. And maybe not surprisingly, you, you, what you find is a word length effect. The mean number of words were called in order, so the order is important, it has to, has to be exact order, is 4.2 words from the first list and 2.8 words from the second list. So it's not just the, the number of items that's important, it's how long it takes you to rehearse those items. Longer words take more time. Now that has some interesting practical applications. Um, languages are different in terms of how long it takes you to pronounce digits. So this is a convoluted graph that actually shows something very simple. Um, so never present data in this fashion. This is uh, unnecessarily complicated. The horizontal axis shows the language variation from English to Spanish, Hebrew, and Arabic. And it measures the mean number of syllables per digit. Now I'm not sure why English is exactly one because seven has two syllables, but English is definitely short, right? Most digits are one syllable long. Arabic, much longer, two or more. It takes you longer, therefore, or the results show in the dash line, to pronounce um, digits in Arabic than in English. But what's interesting, your memory span for English digits, people that are native English speakers, is better than the digit span for Arabic or Spanish or Hebrew native speakers. So that's the solid line going down. So clearly there's a relationship between pronunciation rate and memory span. Now many of you are probably bilingual, or I suspect. Um, and the real world consequence of this is that if you have to remember a phone number or some sequence of digits, and you happen to be native in, in English and native in Spanish, let's say, you're better off remembering in English. There's a higher chance that you remember that sequence simply because it's easier to rehearse, it's easier to hold on to, it's shorter. Does that correspond to your intuition actually? For those of you who are bilingual, you, you would use English as the preferred language? Yeah? Okay. Now, um, George Miller stated that you have seven plus or two, two uh, seven plus or two um, minus um, two items that you can hold on, on in short term memory. But it's not quite clear what items represent. Are items digits, or words, um, is it something else? And as it turns out, you can actually increase your working memory span dramatically by training. Anybody can do this as long um, as they're motivated. So here was a subject SF that had to remember arbitrary uh, sequences of digits. And at the start of training, he was about at, at 10 uh, in terms of digit span, which is pretty good. But as you can see, as time goes on in terms of five day blocks, he managed to get an 80 digit span over time. And the amount of training involved was about roughly 250 hours. So after 250 hours of training, you might be able to have a, an 80 digit span. Now SF, um, he's a runner and he encoded uh, groups of digits in terms of times corresponding to famous running times or times that correspond to sort of times that he's familiar with, uh, times on the five kilometer or 10 kilometer races, etc. So he was grouping digits in terms of things that are meaningful to him. And that allowed him to get a much larger digit span um, than at the beginning. And this process of grouping items in terms of meaningful units is called chunking. So when George Miller says um, you have seven slots, 
you essentially have seven chunks available of information. Where each chunk is whatever is meaningful to you. It's, it's whatever, whatever the ways you group information together. So let's, let's test you out on a, let's see, is that the next one? Yeah, I'm going to show you a sequence. I hope you didn't peek in the slides. Um, and I'm going to show this for, I don't know, five seconds or so. And you have to remember this, this pretty long sequence. Are you ready? Is somebody confident that, that they can recall the whole sequence? Yes? Very good. Very good. So you probably didn't encode the individual letters, right? So what is your strategy? Have you seen this slide before? No. Very good. Yeah, this is very quick. Um, so it's a little tricky because the X, so this, this is your strategy, right? So you separate the X, not quite clear what to do with the X, but the, the other ones, as you said, right? So you have MBC, PhD, SAT, CBS. Those are all meaningful chunks, yes. I'm, 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 yeah, it's very impressive that you, that you did that, that quickly. That is the way to circumvent your uh, limitations of short-term memory. Group it very quickly in terms of meaningful units. Now, I'm going to show you a video that demonstrates um, this, this idea of chunking. Um, and this video will demonstrate that, that Pretty much everybody can learn to chunk, right? As long as you're motivated. It might be extremely boring to try to remember arbitrary material, but you don't have to have special ability to be a good memorizer. Uh, everybody can do this. And the important thing is if you encounter somebody that can remember very long uh, sequences of digits, it's more likely that this person used good memory strategies than this person having some amazing sort of inherent talent or ability to remember things. So let's show this, this short v video clip. Uh, with the case of individual, you can improve the memory performance in, in virtually any areas of, of, of a memory task. Florida State Psychology Professor Anders Erickson has spent years studying superior memory. You're saying that almost anybody can engage in feats of memory that they may not have thought possible. And the factors like how much you know and how interested you are in an area. In the study, you figure it out. Know. Like, for example, you know, some adolescents have no problems remembering scores between athletic teams, but they have tremendous difficulty remembering even a single date in history class. How important to memory is that meaningful connection in your mind? Dr. Erickson said he would show us with help from a graduate student named Rajan, who happens to love the numbers. Could this go row by row like this? Well, Rajan steps out of the room, and Dr. Erickson asks the students to call out the last digit of their social security number, creating a matrix for Rajan to recall. Yeah. After all the minute and ten seconds studying the 36 digits. Okay, I'm done. Rajan is ready to recall the number. Five, six, three, one, nine, seven, four, seven, zero, eight, two, zero, two, four, three, seven, seven, six, two, three, three, nine, eight, eight, six, one, one, nine, zero, zero, one, five, four, five, two, three. How can I do it? Like Katya, Rajan has encoded the numbers into sequences that are meaningful for him, making a story of sorts from the numbers. Four, seven, zero. Uh, that was the starting salary of a friend I knew in India. <laughs> 820 is something embarrassing. I did something at 820 a.m. this morning. I don't want to tell you about. A clever trick that, according to Dr. Harris, 
suggests that there is no such thing as a truly photographic memory, just people with good memory techniques. I don't think there's any credible evidence whatsoever for photographic memory. I've spent about five years trying to find even a single individual who would come close. Back up from the bottom left to the bottom right. Uh, five? Seven? To make his point, Dr. Erickson asked Sajan to recall the numbers diagonal. The picture got longer than when he recalled it in order. Three. That's because Rajan is not seeing a picture of the matrix in his mind at all. He's recalling the meaningful sequences one by one. Right. So that was interesting, that last experiment. Asking the person to retrieve it diagonally. And the person was much, much slower. Right? So it's clearly not reading out from some mental picture of the whole grid of letters. Right? The letters were, uh, or the numbers were clearly organized uh, in, in order, right? in reading order. And so clear evidence against some you know, form of photographic memory. Uh, these are just memory tricks or strategies that any of you uh, can apply. OK, so there are different ways to chunk information. You can think about chunking in terms of chunking digit sequences or letter sequences, word sequences. But chunking is also a more abstract concept of remembering configurations of elements. So there's a classic experiment by Chase and Simon that demonstrated um, that some people have very good memory for things because they remember the configuration well. Um, so in this experiment, subjects were shown a stimulus board of chess pieces. And then they could um, study this uh, stimulus board for, for a while. And then it's taken away. And then the subject has to reproduce the exact pieces, the exact places uh, from memory. Right? So they actually don't see the stimulus board in front of them anymore. Now, in this experiment, there were three groups of subjects. There were beginners. There were class A players, uh, chess players, that are pretty good, but not world class players. And there were uh, chess masters, some of the world's best uh, players. And you can see on the vertical axis <coughs> uh, the number of pieces that they correctly uh, placed uh, by using memory. Now, the finding is that uh, people that play chess a lot, um, they are more able to remember these chess pieces than, let's say, beginners, uh, most of us. <coughs> and that raises the question whether these Chess masters, whether they inherently have better memory or not. Is there something special about their brain, let's say? And as it turns out, uh, they don't have special memory abilities at all. If you use random um, board configurations, <clears throat> excuse me, if you use chess pieces that are organized in some random fashion that would never correspond to actual gameplay, there's no advantage at all of a chess master in this memory experiment. In fact, if anything, they're slightly worse than beginners. And in fact, they're deeply disturbed, these chess masters, by looking at these random uh, boards, like, what, what are you doing? This is, uh, this is a little strange. So the conclusion from this experiment is that chess masters their seeming memory expertise where they can recall sort of all these different configurations of pieces is not because they have better memory in general, but because they chunk the information in particular ways, right? They see configurations of these pieces. And they remember those configurations, and that allows them to uh, uh, make good, good moves. Now, we will see, actually, next week, people that do have special memory skills. Um, their brains are actually very different. But most of us, um, with just normal brains, we can learn to be better just by uh, using chunking strategies. OK, any questions so far? Yes? Um, when they did the experiment with the chess players, the masters, did they, like, were they faster at like, remembering? Did they like, start earlier? Did they all have to like, remember in a lot of time? 
They have the same amount of study time that was controlled for, but I suspect that they were, when it's uh, on the black curve, right? So when it's a valid chess configuration, I suspect they will just put it on there very, very quickly. Yes. Um, but probably this, uh, in this condition, they have a very hard time remembering those, you know, two pieces that, that they managed to get correctly. Yes. Okay, so we talked about chunking. That's one important process in short-term uh, memory. The other important process is rehearsal. Which items get rehearsed and which items you rehearse with uh, determine, determines whether you are able to store things in long-term memory, whether information gets actually transferred from short-term memory to long-term memory. So um, if we do a typical memory test uh, involving words, and I won't test you this time, I'll just show you uh, how a memory test could work with, with words. Let's so if you see this sequence of words, Got that? Actually, I won't test you. Um, so here's the actual sequence of words that you saw, starting with table, ending with hammer. If you test subjects in this experiment and you give the instruction to freely recall words in any order they want, so it doesn't have to be the exact order, any order is fine. And now you plot the performance, the probability of correctly recalling as a function of serial position. You get this finding. So words that are shown early in the list, a word like table, that's the first one, is more likely to be recalled than words from the middle of the list. Words from the end of the list hammer is the last one, is more likely to be recalled than, again, words in the middle of the list. And this is uh, known as a serial position effect. And there are two parts of this. Um, one is the primacy effect. So that's the effect of being better for items early on in the study list. And the other part is the recency effect. That's the ability to recall more correctly from items at the end of the list. So you get these serial position effects, you get this recency effect, if you immediately um, start retrieving at the end of the list. So as soon as hammer, that last word is presented, and you ask subjects to start recalling, you get this recency effect. However, if you interrupt or if you delay the recall, and after this 20th word hammer, you ask subjects to do some mental counting or other sort of mental exercise, and then you ask them to recall, you see the primacy effect, that's still there, but you get no recency effect. And that's sort of a curious uh, finding. And the question is why? why how, how can we explain this on the basis of these memory theories? And the stage theory of memory <clears throat> makes a very nice prediction when it comes to this, and it predicts exactly this, this set of findings. So the primacy effect is explained because as items come in, there's less competition between items early on in the study list. The first word comes in and you have a lot of time to rehearse that word. The second word comes in, you still have some time to rehearse both words. But as you go on and you get more and more items, at some point you hit your uh, memory capacity. <clears throat> you have to rehearse a lot of items at the same time, so you have less time on each individual item. That makes it less likely that you transfer to long-term memory. Because the probability that something gets transferred to long-term memory is dependent on how often you rehearse. 
So that explains the primacy effect. The recency effect is based on just reading out items directly from short-term memory. So if you are immediately asked after last item, what do you recall? Well, the clever thing to do is just recall the things that are fresh in your, in your memory, uh, the last items from the list. But if you have some distractor task and uh, you have to do some mental counting or some other activity, and then you can recall, then all your, uh, your short-term memory is filled up with other material, so it's no longer there, and, th and that removes the recency effect. So this is how the stage theory of memory explains uh, the serial position curve and how the serial position curve changes as a, as a function of manipulation. Does that make sense to you, this explanation? Okay, so the last thing I want to show um, is, is where is memory going on in, in the brain? Specifically, when we try to actively hold on to, to memories, where is that going on? So it turns out the prefrontal cortex, indicated by this dashed uh, region, that is a critical area to remember information to rehearse information before uh, it gets transferred to long-term memory, which involves different brain areas. If your prefrontal cortex is not working properly, uh, you'll have a hard time um, maintaining information. So we notice from animal studies, uh, this is one of the simplest memory studies you could do. You have a monkey observing food that's being placed in front of them in one of these trays. So let's say that the food item is placed in this uh, tray. And the monkey wants to get this food, so it's, it's motivated. And there's some delay. And during this delay period, you cover up the trays and then ask the monkey to uh, later to uh, find the food, which they eagerly do. They do fine um, under normal circumstances. This curve shows you the performance of these monkeys um, that are normal, that's the top curve, as a function of delay. And they do fine, they are 90% accurate for short delays on the, on the left of the curve to very long delays up to 10 minutes on the right side of the curve. Monkeys that have lesions to their prefrontal cortex, they do fine on these very short delays, which is important because it means that their vision is working Right, so they don't have, their entire brain is not, not um, damaged. Uh, but they do much worse with long delays. They seemingly cannot hold on to information over long time, <coughs> time periods. The prefrontal cortex takes time to develop. Infants, infants show results more like these monkeys with damaged uh, prefrontal cortices. Um, so before one year of age, you probably, uh, as a human, uh, you're probably on this curve. And as you grow up, you're, uh, you become more like the normal uh, individual. Now, there are also studies that show at the individual neuron level that there are neurons engaged in the, the process of holding on to a memory which is very difficult to prove, but there's some great experiments that were done to demonstrate that there are neurons engaged in the act of remembering. So in this experiment, a monkey is looking at a visual display, and the visual display is shown here at the top, right? So they're looking at this uh, laboratory display, and they're focusing their eyes on this cross that's at the center of this, the display. They're in fact trained to do this. Uh, they get a reward if they follow instructions. So they're motivated. And then a stimulus comes on. Let's say it's a black square in one of these corner locations. And they're instructed not to move their eyes. Then at a later time, this black square disappears. And they're, again, instructed through reward uh, not to move their eyes for at least three seconds. And then at time three, roughly after three seconds, they move the, their eyes to the position where the black square was shown. 
very simple experiment. So take some training for these monkeys to do this. So it's a simple memory experiment. Hold on to information for at least three seconds. Now the middle uh, panels show you the responses of individual neurons in the prefrontal cortex of this monkey. So it shows you uh, these blue peaks are individual spikes and the horizontal axis is time. So it shows you how these neurons fire over a period of time. Now this experiment shows that this particular set of neurons from prefrontal cortex does not respond when the stimulus is present. Right? There's a few uh, spikes, but it's, it's, it's a pretty low response rate. It does respond at the time when the stimulus disappears and the, the monkey is trying to remember where that stimulus is, or where it was, and this um, uh, neuron is inactive again at the response time. Now this can only be interpreted as, as a memory kind of neuron, uh, as a maintenance kind of neuron, of trying to hold on to information that's no longer there physically, and it's not related to responses because it's again silent when the monkey actually makes a response. And I should say again, the monkey makes response not by a button press, but by moving their eyes. So in this display, the monkey moves the eyes to the location where it was present. So this and many other demonstrations suggest that there are neurons in the prefrontal cortex that roughly do, um, roughly correspond to working memory, um, holding on to information over short periods of time. Does that experiment make sense to you? Yeah? Okay, so just to wrap things up, um, we talked about these different stages uh, of memory, different capacities associated with different durations. Talked about this theory of the theory of the, the stage theory. Nobody believes that that's the, the theory of memory, um, but it's an important theory of memory. We no longer talk about short-term memory, we tend to talk more about working memory, but the two concepts are really related. Uh, and next week we'll talk about some amazing individuals that um, are either very poor at holding on to information, they forget a lot, and people that are excellent rememberers, they uh, have almost perfect memory. And we'll talk about that next week. Right. See you then.